So, we will conclude the discussion of interference which we started in the previous lecture in this lecture and incidentally we will also conclude the course with this lecture by studying or rather getting a glimpse of how interference experiments very careful interference experiments actually lead us to the quantum theory of light the photon concept. So, in some sense what we are going to do is to lay down the conceptual foundations of what you call modern physics or quantum mechanics through the so called single photon interference experiment, which cannot be understood in terms of either an ordinary corpuscular theory or the wave theory. And I am also going to give you experimental evidence as to how the same kind of interference pattern is seen in other systems. So, with that in mind, what I will do is to resume my discussion of the classic Young's double slit experiment. So, the double slit experiments configuration is something that I wrote. So, let me very briefly summarize what is it that I did. So, what I had was two slits. So, let me draw them here. Please treat them as straight lines. So, you have the slit S 1 here, you have the slit S 2 here, grossly exaggerated. And then this is the midpoint, the source is sitting somewhere here. And from this midpoint, you are going to draw a straight line. So, let me extend it and somewhere here, you are going to put the screen. The dimensions are suggestive, that is the distance between the slits is small compared to the distance between the slits and the screen. So, let me indicate that here. I said that this distance is z. I am going to take a point p on the screen and let me say that this distance is x. You have the source, a coherent source and there are two slits s 1 and s 2. They are along the x axis. This is my z axis, this is the x axis. So, let me locate the position of s 1 by the vector d by 2, which is actually along the x axis and this will be minus d by 2. This is my vector and from the midpoint, I can actually draw a line which I shall do now and what is that? Let me connect it to p. Let me connect it to p. Let me erase this bad part of the line okay? and let me call this distance r. This is from the origin. The two slits are moved with respect to the origin along the positive x axis and along the negative x axis. So, we shall indicate them through some other colored lines, so that there is no confusion. So, what is it that I do? I join these two and I join these two lines. Very good. And this is what I will call as R 1 and this is what I will call as R 2. Everyone knows how to add vectors. We know how to write R 1 in terms of R and D by 2. We know how to write R 2 in terms of R and D by 2. That is something that I wrote in my previous lecture, transparency. So, we have R 1 is equal to R minus D by 2, is that right? And R 2 is equal to R plus D by 2. Please, let us not forget our basic premise, namely Z by X is a very small number and so is Z by D. So, z by x and z by d are small numbers, so large numbers rather. So, x by d not d, x by z much, much less than 1 and d by z much, much less than 1. These are the conditions that I have. I also introduced the proper angles, so that we can write down r 1, r 2, d and r in the in terms of the signs and causes. So, what I do in order to do that is to draw two lines parallel, call this angle beta and call this angle alpha. So, now you know how to write down cos alpha, sin alpha, cos beta, sin beta by simple trigonometry and with these things we were able to write down the expression for the total electric field. And what is the expression for the total electric field that I wrote? I wrote E 1 E is equal to E 1 0 cos, let me open a big bracket, K 1. K 1 is the wave vector, the direction of propagation corresponding to the ray from the split S 1. Let me go back and show it to you. 
So, this is the ray from the slit S 1 k 1 is along this particular direction dot r minus d by 2 that is what I have here at the point p minus omega t. So, I am evaluating the net electric field at the point p we should not forget that. So, one thing I can do is actually move it slightly to the left and right e at the point p along the x axis that is what I have here. This is from the slit 1 and from the slit 2 I have e 2 0 cos k 2 dot r plus d by 2 minus omega t. I am not going to write the expression for k 1 and k 2 in terms of cos alpha sin alpha cos beta sin beta which I have derived here defined here there is the alpha and there is the beta there is a small difference. But in the leading order, what is my leading order? In the leading order, when x by z much much less than 1, d by z much much less than 1, we have the screen far off, we can forget all difference between k 1 and k 2. It is as if they are coming parallel to each other. We need not forget we need not bother about the small difference coming because of the change in the angle. Therefore, what we do is to say k 1 approximately equal to k 2. Of course, the magnitude is the same it was the direction alone that differed for the two cases, but in this limit we are going to make this assumption and if we did that now what follows is a very very simple calculation that we have to do and that is let me write it down first e of p is nothing but e 1 0 cos. Now, I am going to use the same k, k dot r minus d by 2 minus omega t. This is at any given time at the sub point p plus e 2 0 cos k dot r plus d by 2 minus omega t. So, the change in the phase of the field coming from the first slit and the second slit is entirely due to the path difference, you need not worry about the change in the direction that is what we said. Now, given E, the point that I was emphasizing for you people that is very, very important is that Maxwell's equations are additive in the fields. So, Maxwell's equations imply additivity of fields. Fields add up. That is the reason why I was able to write E is equal to E 1 0 of this plus E 2 0 of this. By the way, I am making a distinction between E 1 0 and E 2 0 because suppose there is this source which is emitting the radiation. So, let me indicate it here. So, there is a ray which is coming here and there is a ray which is coming here. In principle, what you can do is to put a polarizer here. So, this is my polarizer. I can put a polarizer and can keep on changing the direction of the electric field, which is the reason why we write E 1 0 and E 2 0 separately in this. There is no harm if they are both parallel to each other, if you did nothing to them, but in general they can also be different and such experiments are done. Now, let me return to whatever I was telling you. Maxwell's equations imply additivity of fields that is E equal to E from the slit S 1 and the E from the slit S 2. What is the relation between the intensity and the field? The intensity, let me go back to my original color, the intensity is quadratic in the fields, in the field strength mod E squared. More intense the beam, greater the energy carried by the beam. Therefore, the energy is also quadratic in the amplitude. Is that okay? It is not linear in the amplitude. So, suppose there are two rays of light as shown in this particular picture. So, this is carrying an intensity I 1. So, let me indicate that here and this is carrying an intensity I 2. If this were a stream of particles, and if this were another stream of particles, 
the intensities would have added up the intensities would have added up but no what adds up is not the intensity but the amplitudes which are something like the square root of the intensity more correctly intensity is actually the magnitude square root of the amplitude we have to first add the amplitudes and then only calculate the intensity and let us not forget that the addition of the amplitudes is vectorial when it is vectorial there is no reason that when i add these two together the magnitude should actually increase the magnitude can increase the magnitude can decrease and that is what gives rise to the phenomenon of interference so let me write down the intensity now if i were to to write the total intensity i total at the point p the first term comes from the intensity due to the beam 1 which is my beam 1 i1 the second term comes i2 and the third term comes from the superposition of the two terms so let me group them here in this particular expression this is going to contribute to i1 this is going to contribute to i2 whereas the cross term between the two is going to contribute to what i will call as i12 what we are obviously interested is what this i12 is going to do because that is the new term which is there which is the dot product of the inner product of these two terms if the intensities had added i would have got i equal to i1 plus i2 so very well let us do that um i total of p is therefore is given by i 1 of p coming from this slit 1 plus i 2 of p and the third one will be i 1 2 of p this is my pictorial way of writing i 1 of p is a constant it is not going to matter to me i 2 of p is a constant it is not going to matter to me so therefore let me write down the cross term i 1 2 of p apart from multiplicative factors epsilon not etc etc let us not worry about that you people can see that this is nothing but 2 e10 dot e20 cos i have k dot r minus d by 2 minus omega t multiplying cos k dot r plus d by 2 minus omega t please remember that when i am writing i1 p and i2 p these quantities are time averaged these quantities are time averaged so what i have to do is to perform a time averaging of these also why should i perform a time average let us not forget some basic facts if i am performing an experiment in the visible spectrum then the frequencies of the order of 10 to the power of 15 hertz 10 to the power of 14 hertz what do i mean by that in one second the electromagnetic wave oscillates 10 to the power of 14 times each oscillation takes 10 to the power of minus 14 seconds or 10 to the power of minus 15 seconds and my detector cannot detect that in particular my eyes cannot detect that the maximum efficiency of my detector is of the order of a millisecond even if it were to be microsecond there are already 10 to the power of 6 10 to the power of 14 10 to the power of 8 times the electromagnetic wave has oscillated at that point therefore it is prudent to take the time average so we should calculate the time average that i will indicate by this line angular brackets and let us see how to do that so the time averaging is what is to be performed and what is this quantity let me repeat it 2 cos k dot r minus d by 2 minus omega t into cos k dot r plus d by 2 minus omega t how do we do the average when we do the average we should only keep those terms which do not vanish because cos is an oscillatory function but there will be some combination of these two functions which will not actually vanish how do we do that first of all let us make use of the famous formula 2 cos a cos b is what cos of a plus b by 2 cos of a minus b by 2 so apart from all the other factors which i will indicate like this what is this expression this is nothing but k cos cos of k dot r minus omega t that is the term number 1 plus 
So we are going to write the product of two cos functions as a sum of two cos functions. The next term is the most interesting expression for us. This is nothing but k dot d. This is what we are going to get. Is that okay? Now you can clearly see that my i12 is what I have. There is an e10 dot e20 which I will insert at this particular point e20. When I perform the time average, this term gives me zero. In fact, over any period, my cost function becomes zero. This is the only term that survives. Therefore, now we know how to write down the interference term. So, the interference term looks like E10 dot E20 cos k dot d. This is my interference term, and to this is added two terms which are constant. They are not going to change with d or k. Okay. Once we have this expression at our disposal, it is a very, very simple calculation for us to plug this expression and ask when this will be a minimum and when this will be a maximum. Is that okay? So, clearly, one thing you can see is that cos k dot d is a maximum when k dot d is equal to 2 n pi. What are the values n takes? 0, 1, 2, etcetera. Why is it so? Cos 0 equal to cos 2 pi equal to cos 4 pi is equal to 1. Cos function starts with 1. But on the other hand, cos k dot d is a minimum when k dot d is equal to 2 n plus 1 pi n equal to 0, 1, 2, etcetera. So, what do I do now? If I take both the polarizations to be parallel, then this will be a positive quantity and if k dot d equal to 2 n pi, that means you have enhanced your intensity. Ordinarily, if there were an incoherent superposition, your total intensity would have been what? I total. It would have been just I 1 plus I 2. Now, it moves up by a factor E 1 0 dot E 2 0 cos k dot d. But on the other hand, when the two polarizations are parallel to each other, that is you do not tamper with whatever the original polarization was, what is going to happen? If k dot d equal to 2 n plus 1 pi, that is pi, 3 pi, 5 pi, 7 pi, so on and so forth, odd multiples of pi, then this is going to be negative and the amplitude is going to be suppressed. So, the point that we are making is, as we move along the screen, as we move along the screen, along the x axis, my k dot d is going to change. k dot d changes as we move along the screen. And therefore, if I were to place my detector all along the screen, is that right? Or if I were to move my detector along the screen, you will find a series of maxima and a series of minima. It is a trivial trigonometric exercise to write down what that thing is. Let us not forget what my k dot d is. k dot d, my d is along the x axis, is nothing but k d sin alpha, that is what I have. So, I think it was in page 6, okay, the previous page where I defined my alpha. So, your sin alpha is nothing but x by z. So, if I were to expand it, this is nothing but x by z, that is what I have here. So, let me go to the next page. This implies this is equal to k d x by z. x is the distance at which my detector is and z is the distance at which my screen is from the two slits. Okay. Let us not forget the definition of k 2 pi by lambda. Therefore, I have 2 pi by lambda. I am looking at a quasi monochromatic plane wave, monochromatic plane wave as far as we are concerned. D is the distance between the two slits x by z 
is equal to 2 n by for maxima. Of course, if the polarizations were anti parallel, suppose the first beam was polarized along the positive x direction and the second beam, the beam from the second state was polarized along the negative z, then the roles would have been interchanged. We should always remember that. This is for parallel polarizations and that is what we encounter most of the time unless I put a polarizer. So, let me cancel my 2 pi on both the sides. I will get x n is simply given by n lambda z by x. So, all these points you get a maximum. In fact, the intensity will be I think twice the intensity I 1 plus I 2. It will get added up the interference term. What about the minima? I will leave that as an exercise for you people to work out. So, speaking pictorially, so if this is my screen, the really speaking I will have a quite a pronounced peak and then it goes like this. The periodicity will be there, but the peak value keeps on decreasing although this formula does not give because of losses and things like that. So, now you know how to locate the positions of the maxima. This is 1, this is 1, this is 1, this is the next one, so on and so forth equally spaced. In this double slit experiment, what you should notice is that we do not get sharp minima or sharp maxima, you get fairly broad and this width you can evaluate because I just now wrote down the cos function for you. If you want a sharp minima and sharp maxima, very, very sharp lines, then you do not perform an experiment with double slit, but you perform an experiment with what is called as a grating. I am sure you people have done this experiment with gratings and as you keep on decreasing the spacing between the gratings, the maxima and minima become sharper and sharper and it will be virtually thin lines, diffraction grating, that is what it is, right? right? But we will not get into that, but what I will request you is to please remember that this is the curve that I am going to get. Is this the curve that I am going to get? This is an experimental uh, subject after all electromagnetic theory. What I have done is merely a theoretical analysis. So, let me look at an experimental result and ask if this is indeed what I get. Okay. Please do not bother about the bottom curves. So, let me indicate for you what is it that you should not look at. Is that right? So, let me use that. So, ignore this and what should you concentrate on the green signal? Concentrate on them, on this. This is an interference pattern which is taken with ordinary light. So, you can see that is what it tells you. It tells obtained with bulb green filter illumination. So, let me highlight that. You see that ordinary light. You see that this is the central maxima and it is flanked is that right? It is flanked by secondary maxima, tertiary maxima and so on and so forth and this shows the classic cost behavior. Okay. Now, what I want you people to do is to look at another figure which is there in the next slide and ask you what is this figure representing. Look at this figure, look at this figure they look the same, you would have told me, well, you wanted us to concentrate on this particular curve. Therefore, what you did was to remove these two bottom lines and they are showing us this curve. But in reality, that is not what has happened. In reality, what has happened is something extraordinarily interesting. So, this was my grating and let me explain the setting for you. You still have an interference pattern. So, I have my classic double slit very good. And then what I have is these two sources which are coming, is that right? But what I do is, so let me imagine that this was my point P. So, there is this light beam coming here, there is this light beam coming here. Here, I will put two crossed polarizers, which I will indicate like this. So, let me fill it up to indicate that these are crossed polarizers. So, similarly, I will put two crossed polarizers, right. So, maybe I should write it up and then fill it up. Okay. These are not perfectly crossed, but almost crossed. 
polarizers you know very well that if the polarizers are perfectly crossed the intensity that comes out will be zero because the first polarizer cuts off half the radiation the second polarizer cuts off the other half of the radiation therefore almost perfectly crossed it is not perfectly crossed but almost perfectly crossed so that the intensities are very very small intensities are very very small how small that is the question in order to give you an idea of how small these intensities are let me go back and tell you what is it that i did if you give me a wavelength and if you give me an intensity i can immediately associate the number of photons per unit volume why because i wrote the energy density is simply given by n into h nu as my intensity keeps on decreasing my energy density keeps on decreasing because there is very little radiation in any given unit volume this is a fixed number this is a fixed number because i am not tampering with the frequency and this goes to zero so please tell me what happens when it goes to zero when it goes to zero the only way the right hand side can go to zero is n goes to zero so you can make an estimate for ordinary sunlight what will be the number of photons assuming that the peak frequency is in the blue green region that will turn out to be a very large number 10 to the power of 18 10 to the power of 20 now if you actually make the intensity so small that there is only one photon between this lit and the peak so the intensity is so small only one photon actually between this lit and the detector that is what we do now when it comes to only one photon between this lit and the detector let me go back that means actually what i have is the polarizer is shutting it off everywhere now i would like to ask what is it that happens to the interference experiment you would expect that nothing much should happen because there is nothing that is reaching the screen in order to make it a little bit more closer to reality what i will do is i will consider a slightly different configuration in fact that is what i should have considered in the first place so there are these two rays coming here i will put perfectly almost perfectly crossed what polarizers and analyzers here and then i will ask if there is an interference pattern is that part okay so you can imagine that the experiment is done in two parts one thing is you put it between the between uh, you place the polarizer and the analyzer in between the what the two slits and the de detector that is not of any great interest to us but what is of great interest to us is this particular configuration now normally how do i inter understand interference let us go back to the huygens picture in the huygens picture you assume that there is a source here it produces secondary waves there is a source here it produces secondary waves it is this interference that gives rise to interference pattern superposition now what i have done is to put a source here and i am sending a radiation let me indicate it in the brick red color now i am putting a cross polarizer cross polarizer that is what i am doing i cannot use the wave picture when i am using the photon picture therefore there is no question of waves expanding and this is my source and this is my screen now between the source and the screen let us say the distance is some capital d suppose there is only one photon that goes at a given time then the photon should take either this path or this path it cannot take both the paths is that part right because we do not know how to divide a photon a photon is an indivisible unit therefore in this configuration we should not expect any interference pattern so let me write it boldly no interference pattern expected okay now what i do is to return to my other slide 
This experiment is actually taken from a laser beam. The intensity became so small that there was only one photon on an average between the source and the screen. You do not expect any interference pattern. However, what people did was to put the lot of diode detectors, there is okay, lot of photo detectors. You wait for a long time, you find what is it that you find? Perfect interference pattern. Perfect pattern of interference interference. In other words, even when you go over to the photon picture of Planck and Einstein and imagine those photons to be particulate, that they are going to behave like corpuses, even then if I did a careful experiment, maintain the coherence and all that, I still find an interference pattern. That means, there is much more to Maxwell's equations and its solutions than simply look upon it as some ordinary wave. Conversely, if you take the notion of quantum very seriously, corpuscular nature, there is much more to the nature of the particle aspect of light than simply imagining that it is like a small bullet which is moving. Because classically bullets shall not interfere and classically waves shall not show particle like behavior. But here we have a peculiar situation where I have only one photon at a given time, therefore it is particle like, but I still produce this interference pattern. Historically, this is not the way Maxwell's equations gave rise to modern physics or quantum mechanics. Historically, what happened was, as you all know, there was the black body radiation problem, there was the photoelectric effect, then there was the problem with the Rutherford model of the atom, because accelerating charged particles have to radiate, eventually electrons should collapse inside the nucleus. Then there was the problem of Compton scattering, but today we have actually realized we have reached a stage where technologically we can realize experimentally all these conceptual things and this is an experiment done very, very recently, sometime in 1998 or so and it is only about 10 years ago and you find this very beautiful pattern. So, if you think that therefore, quantum mechanics should be there only for light, we are mistaken. In fact, this phenomenon is seen in almost every other quantum object. People have performed single atom interferometry, single molecular interferometry, single electron interferometry and also single neutron interferometry. So, for the sake of completion, let me show you this very beautiful experimental setup. This is from a result which is as close to us as possible. This is an experiment reported in Nature in 2003 by the famous Vienna group, I think. So, you have a reactor which will produce thermal neutrons and if you believe in Davieser and Germer experiments which you have studied, what should you do? You should show wave like behavior. This is the interferometer. One thing I would like to concentrate on this particular region, these are called silicon interferometers. This is the great advance in uh, technology, these are perfect single crystals. Perfect means what? Not a single defect and these are of millimeter length, a few millimeter length okay? and defects may be of the order of micron, so or even smaller than that. So, it is as if you know, you cannot find even a small blemish anywhere, all where completely perfect, even the cutting is perfect, the planes are perfect, that is what they did and what you do is to ensure by putting again lot of moderators, you know, which are familiar from your nuclear reactor such that there is only one neutron at any given time. Then you put your detector and ask for the intensity profile and lo and behold, what do you get? You get the beautiful cross pattern, which is again an interference pattern. So, this is the remarkable thing. Maxwell's equations naturally explain to you what the idea of interference is when it comes to electromagnetic waves. It tells you why perpendicularly polarized light beams do not interfere with each other, but then taken to its limit when the intensity becomes very, very small and therefore, quantum mechanics has to be invoked. Again, you find that there is an interference pattern and is that interference pattern restricted to Maxwellian dynamics to light? No, it seems to be common to all quantum substances, to all quantum systems, whether it is an electron or a molecule or a proton or a neutron or for that matter even macroscopic quantities like Bose-Einstein condensates. I am sure all of you have heard of Bose-Einstein condensates, 
because people got a Nobel Prize just a few years ago, the famous MIT group and the French group. Is that okay? In order to understand this, we need to reinterpret our solutions for E and B, and that will take much, much beyond our course. E and B will be interpreted as probability amplitudes. They will not be interpreted as functions, but they will become operators. That indeed is the great revolution which was initiated by whom? Bohr, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, right, and Dirac. Dirac was the first person to quantize electromagnetic field and Pauli. And today we have a theory called quantum electrodynamics, the quantum version of Maxwellian electrodynamics, where we can understand all these things. The point that I want to emphasize at this stage, although you may not be able to follow what I told you just now, is that in doing that, we have not touched Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations are still correct, only their interpretation has changed. In other words, Maxwell himself dreamt little of how important his equations will be. So, this is almost reaching the fag end of the course. The only point that I would like to make at this particular uh, juncture is to quote from whom? From uh, Feynman. In his lectures, Feynman says that 1000 years hence, okay, when people write the history of civilization, human civilization, what is it that people would be interested in? All the great advances. What were the people? What were their intellectual pursuits? And what were their ambitions? What were their aspirations? If you ask these questions, Feynman says that the great development in electrodynamics that took place over 300 years, right, starting from the fundamental experiments of Coulomb and Cavendish, all the way up to the great equations written by Maxwell, that will take several pages, whereas what we consider to be a very important event today, right, like American Civil War, will not even find a place in the footnote. That is what Feynman says. In other words, what I am trying to tell you is that what we have tried to accomplish in the last 28 lecture or so, including this, it will be the 29th lecture, is to gain a glimpse, to gain an insight, to gain an appreciation of this immense intellectual endeavor where hundreds of people, hundreds of nameless people participated. People did painstaking experiments. People tried to interrupt, they interpret them. People repeated the experiments. People modified the experiments. People collected immense data. They were not happy to simply tabulate the data. They looked for the inner truth, whatever the inner content is. And ultimately, what Maxwell could do was to bring all the equations together, give us the Maxwell's equations, which seem to be established very, very firmly. We have found no violation all the way from something like 10 to the power of minus 17 centimeters to all the way up to something like 10 to the power of maybe 20 centimeters some galactic range or whatever. Okay, Probably this is even a larger number, let us not worry about that. It spans something like 40 orders of magnitude, something which no theory can boast of. So, what is it that we try to learn in electrodynamics? Let us ask ourselves. It is humanly impossible to cover all the topics that are there even in your syllabus, let alone the subject itself. Is that okay? In 20 lectures, for that matter even in 40 lectures, although we exceeded whatever our quota is by a few lectures. Okay, But what we have tried to do at every point and every lecture was to try to gain insight. Every discipline has many, many aspects. One is information, which is very crucial for us because we use information to our advantage. Another is technique, which is very, very crucial to us because without technique, information is of no use because you do not know how to manipulate. The third one is the insight. So, there is a saying, we should not miss the wood for the trees. right? We should be able to get a perspective. We should be able to get a broad picture. That is the third one. And doing all this, we should be actually be able to appreciate what kind of a human endeavor it is. There is no way that one can retain all the information. But if you have the crucial information, crucial pieces of information in your mind, because they are the landmarks in the development of the subject, then you are safe. All the other bits and pieces of information can always be picked up. In a similar manner, it is impossible to remember all the techniques. You do so many courses, vector analysis, vector calculus, differential geometry, uh, differential equations, calculus, is that right? Calculus of variations, how many techniques will you remember? But if you remember the basic techniques, which actually gave rise to the field, then you can always relearn the techniques, even if you have forgotten. So, you have to remember some basic techniques. You have to have the basic pieces of information more than anything else. You should have 
a capability of penetrating into what is the true essence of the subject and that is something that we have tried to understand. So, we started with the humblest of the beginnings, we started with the idea of a scalar field, a vector field, then we defined very, very important quantities without which electrodynamics can be cannot be understood. What were they? Gradient, Curl, Stokes theorem, Gauss's theorem. All these theorems were not created in vacuum. They were created because people wanted to understand physical phenomena, flow of fluids, irrotational behavior, rotational behavior, so on and so forth. Then we started from the most basic of the experiments, Coulomb's experiment, Cavendish's experiments. Then we introduced the medium. We studied the modification brought about by the medium to the electrodynamics in free space. We were lucky enough to codify that in terms of the permittivity. What is it then we did? We studied electrostatics in medium, then we looked at the conductors, we looked at the magnetic field, we looked at Ohm's law, which is a great embarrassment, which is also a great source of all kinds of applications, that is something that I discussed. Then logically proceeding, I made a time dependent magnetic field, which will give rise to an electric field, that was Faraday's law of induction. And finally, anchoring ourselves very, very firmly on one fundamentally very well established fact, namely the conservation of energy. What is it that I did? I modified Maxwell's equations. I followed Maxwell the way he modified his equations. We introduced the displacement current and that gave rise to electromagnetic waves which were identified with light. In other words, over a set of about 30 lectures, you have covered the great developments that have taken place over last 300 years. So, what you should do is to listen to these lectures carefully, think over the concepts that are introduced, solve as many problems as you can, okay? formulate problems for yourself. If possible, please go to your laboratories and define design experiments for yourself and try to verify for yourself every single statement that has been made. Infinitely long solenoid is a figment of our imagination, but take a long solenoid, try to keep away, take a magnetometer, measure the magnetic field and see whether it agrees with your calculation. It is very easy to make a calculation of an infinite sheet, but suppose this is a finite sheet and I take this point and I will ask you what is the electric field at this particular point, it is not easy at all, but make a measurement and try to evolve an approximate technique mathematically to solve. So, what we should do is not try to become bookish and try to solve problems in the book which you anticipate in your examination. Rather, I would exhort you, I would urge you, I would request you to formulate for yourself interesting problems, try to solve them by any technique that you can, go to the laboratory, make a measurement and see whether it agrees or not. If you did that, you would be at the same time be innovative, rigorous, careful and disciplined and that I believe is the purpose of courses like NPTEL. So, let us conclude the course at this particular point. The only statement that I would wish to make is that all these lectures would not have been possible, but for the real initiative taken by a host of people from our institutions, the IITs and also the enlightened attitude taken by the government of India. So, probably all of us and you students especially to be grateful to the organizers, to the people who actually conceived the idea called NPTEL who have collected a band of lot of people to give lectures to you and the best way that you can actually return the benefits that you might have get from this course or any other course is to understand, imbibe and try to teach your own students at a later stage. Thank you.